than 51, but 51 was an improvement over our previous high. So we were glad to have everybody here to celebrate 52 years of Heritage Baptist Church. Uh, if anybody didn't see the PowerPoint history, I can send it to you in a link. Uh, this afternoon at 4.30 or 16.30, whichever you prefer to call it, uh, my wife will be doing WOW, and that's Women of the Word uh, in the Fellowship Hall. And uh, they'll start with a little video and then have a Bible study. And I think they usually have some... Uh, you know, drinks. Uh, uh, next Wednesday night, we will have a business meeting. And then I want to remind everybody, talking to members here, not to visitors, but uh, of our missions program. The church supports about $1,600 uh, per month to missions. And the way we do that is through individual giving. And I can give you one of these if you need it. But it's, uh, it's faith promise giving. So this is basically you promising the Lord uh, what you will give above and beyond your tithe to the mission. Now, I want you can't see it from here, but I'm going to assure you, there's no place on this for your name. There's no place on this for your name. This is not a pledge. Nobody's going to pick up the phone call and go, Hey, Christian, you turned in that paper and you said you were going to give, but you didn't, so we need that money. Now, this is between you and the Lord. Now, I will tell you that the Bible says don't promise God something and not do it. But the only person that's going to know that is you and the Lord, okay? We won't have a clue. But it will just help us to uh, figure out what we can do with our missions budget. We do have probably a couple of projects that we're going to cease to support. But uh, we would still be giving about $1,400 or $1,500 a month to that. So, just pray about what the Lord would have you do, and we will take those up before the end of the uh, month, sometime, probably the last Sunday of the month. I should quit advertising for McDonald's, amen. So the, the good news is uh, the ladies are safe, but most some of the ladies that generally sing are traveling, so you have to, you're stuck with me today uh, leading the singing. But we've been doing a children's message to start each week. And uh, we started with uh, creation some time ago. And, and last week we talked about all of the wonderful things Jesus did from giving sight to the blind, to healing the sick, uh, to calming the storm. And in spite of all of those wonderful things that Christ did, many people hated him. In fact, they didn't just dislike him, they wanted to kill him. And what is most amazing about that fact is it was the church crowd that wanted to kill him. It was the religious crowd that wanted to kill him. Uh, uh, they said, the religious crowd said with their lips that they loved God, but in reality they didn't even know it. We will talk about it this Wednesday night. But, you know, Jesus doesn't need to know. I never tell somebody, you're saved. You're not. I never do that because I can't see in your heart. But we'll learn Wednesday night from the last few verses of John chapter 2 that Jesus can see in your heart. In fact, the Bible says that he didn't need anybody to tell him what was in man because he knew what was in man. But Jesus called these religious crowd hypocrites where John had called them vipers. Uh, they hated him. What they did is they convinced, a, what is a hypocrite? Let me, let me just ask you that real quick. What is a hypocrite? Somebody tell me what a hypocrite is. Joe? It is someone who pretends uh, to be a Christian or uh, in that time true and uh, what, what was out, what was only outwardly but not in the heart. Someone who pretends to be something they are not. We use it. In, in church to talk about somebody who pretends to be a Christian, but, you know, there's a commercial right now uh, for somebody who's, who wants to be a vegan, but she's ordering chicken nuggets late at night, and they say, hey, we see you ordering those chicken nuggets, right? So, I mean, it can be used in other settings, but in Christian, uh, in Christianity, we use it to refer to somebody who professes to be a Christian, but they are not. Judas was such a man. And the Jews, the religious in crowd, they paid Judas to betray Christ. And so one night, uh, they came and took Christ from his place of prayer, which is the Garden of Gethsemane there. And they accused him of all of this wrongdoing and, and craziness. But 
that they paid false witnesses, but they were contradictory, so the only thing they could accuse Christ of was what? Claiming to be God. And he was. Amen. So, uh, again, I'm you're, you're stuck with me. It's going to be the Hallman Dog and Pony Show this morning. But let's all stand. Turn to number 80. Oh, no, that's 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 somebody else's hymn book they gave me. You can call her name, but it's Logan. Uh, we're going to turn to 84 in this one, and we're going to sing A Mansion Over the Hilltop. A Mansion Over the Hilltop. I think we're going to sing the first and the last. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Good to see Eileen this morning. Good morning. I just was talking about in Sunday school how busy you've been. <laughs> Church for us. 
And so, uh, with God's leading, Brother Jim and another man organized the first church like this that was organized by and for the U.S. military. It's called Maranatha Baptist Church in Okinawa, Japan, just a few months after I was born. In October of 1968, they started that church. So, it is where our church is 52 years old. That church is uh, soon to be 54 years old. Just an amazing work. And he's been in God's service for 30 some odd years uh, <clears throat> and helped military churches around the world. Uh, even though I fell out of touch with, with him, your influence. Every Paul needs a Timothy and every Timothy needs a Paul. Now, if my dad were living, he would have turned 84 yesterday. But as God would have it, I surrendered to preach in December of 96. And my dad died just before his 59th birthday in uh, March of <coughs> 97. So when I decided I needed to go to Bible college, I couldn't ask my dad where to go. <laughs> That's who I called. I can't tell you how many men have been affected, literally hundreds, maybe even thousands, by the faithfulness of this one man. So my question to you in our missions moment this morning is, by Christian life and commitment, who inspires you? But then the second question is, who is inspired by your Christian life and commitment? Because it's not just the pastor, hey, Miss Sherry, it's not just the pastor's job to reach people for Christ. When God gave the Great Commission, so we have this missions moment every week, but when God gave the Great Commission, there were over 500 people there, and to my knowledge, there were only 11 preachers. And he said to the church, Go ye therefore. So, who are you following? Whose faith is encouraging you? And who's encouraged by your faith? Let's stand again. Let's get this hymn book. If you want to know the notes, the words will be on the page. And we're going to uh, sing kind of a prayerful tune. I come to the garden alone. It's 269 in the Majesty Hymnal. Well, 268 is a good one. Do that one. I come to the garden No, no. 
life lesson and one of the one of the verses we taught our children when they were little is in a multitude of words there wanteth not sin there lacketh not sin so I'm going to tell you it's kind of a mission story but this would be not necessarily such a good mission story there were a group of missionaries amongst the Huron people they are also called the Wyandot uh, these are native peoples to the Americas uh, they were part of the Iroquois uh, Confederacy, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, the Seneca, and the Tuscarora. These tribes inhabited basically from North Carolina to Montreal to Michigan. Uh, the missionaries there had a servant who had learned the sound of their language. But you know, you can learn the sound of something and not really know the meaning of something. And this servant was known to stand up and just give long oratory. He had no idea what he was saying. Okay? But the 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 Hurons, they were the Wyandots there, they were so impressed they would just sit and listen to him talk for hours. And <clears throat> their mindset was that. Well, he's speaking our language because it sounded like their language. And they just assumed that he was more educated than they, so they couldn't understand him. But they would listen to him talk for long periods of time. Now, we could and should shame this unscrupulous man. But we need to take a look at the mirror of God's word. As I already quoted to you, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10, In a multitude of words there wanteth or lacketh not sin, but he just refrained his lips his wife. In other words, if we talk too much, there's sin in there somewhere. And, and sometimes we think that's funny, right? To just talk all the time. And somebody tells a story, we have to top that story. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 that every idle word that men speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Think about that. Now I'm going to give you a Mississippi proverb. Okay? In a multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. There's sin in there if you talk too much. And if you talk too much, your idle words, empty words, you're going to give an account. Now let me put that in Mississippi terms for a practical lesson. You ready? It's better to keep your mouth closed and let them think you're a fool, then open your mouth and remove all doubt, okay? Three of y'all got that, but <laughs> let's stand and turn to number 143. 143. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody out here. 
this morning. So all these smiling faces and even the ones that ain't smiling. <laughs> you know, we've been praying a lot and we, we have a lot of faith that God works and he does. And you see people be healed. You see people coming to the Lord. You see a lot of things happening in the in the spiritual community. And I pray, pray you so much that this church is the church it needs to be in this community. You know, we pray for the church for growth and for its spirituality, for for us to become closer to walk with Jesus. We pray for our country and our leaders. God knows they need some prayer right now. There's a lot of things, a lot of decisions being made, and only with the guidance of God do those decisions need to be made. And sometimes I think they're just, uh, they don't look to anybody, they just, but anyway. The leaders of our uh, government and states and also the German government over here. There's a, a lot of a lot of things happening over here as well. Um, we need to pray for the economy and uh, the situation in the Ukraine. Uh, every day I wake up and I'm afraid to turn the news on because of what's going on over there and the people that are suffering and, and happening things over in the Ukraine. You know, and I think, I, I pray, and I wish we would all get on our hands and knees once a day and pray for the world to come to a revival. We talk about the, the, the great um, revivals throughout history. We, we, through prayer, can cause a great revival to come into play. We just have to get on our knees and ask God for it. We need to ask for comfort for several families that have lost loved ones, marriages to be reconciled and strengthened, the Nisa family, Hill family, and a couple others. Um, there's a lot of jobs out there right now that are carrying a uh, high degree of stress, long hours, uh, even more now that this thing's kicked off in Ukraine. I know there's a couple of us in the room that have had to work much longer hours and, and travel much greater distances than we normally do. And we need to pray for those uh, people, those folks. Um, we need to pray for uh, Miss Chamberlain for, for traveling mercies. Um, we need to help. There's always unspoken prayer requests as well. There's always people that give out a prayer requests, but it may be too personal to, to actually say what it is. And we need to pray for those. those uh, we need to, need to pray for uh, health for Shelly Martinez, McKaylee Wilson, Brainerd Lund, who has skin problem, Inga and Eric, and uh, also Miss Arlene and Phil. Hope things are better there. And John and Lan, again, it's always good to see you guys here in church. We need to pray for our, our um, extended friends and family with chronic health issues, um, like Miss Iris Cannon, the guy I just put on the airplane. And the reason he's going back early is his wife was in a really horrible car accident where she shattered both of her legs. Her left femur uh, was broken, and her right foot and right uh, shin was broken before so that she just messed up wheelchair bound and uh, so that's why he went back and I just pray that you pray for those folks the, all the folks that are having uh, medical difficulties and also pray for those that are having uh, food boxing issues as well <laughs> and know uh, it's uh, it's nothing to life about we need to help the pastor out if we can about that and not rub it in too much <laughs> Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. And Father, every time I stand before you, before you and, and lay these prayers out, Father, I think about so much about you are standing, listening, looking, and see our hearts. You don't see my words, because my words can never be enough to, to tell how wonderful you are. But Father, through, through the love of your Son, we can express these things through, through our emotions, but Father, also through our desire to serve you, there's so many things going on in our world today, and these are just a few of them. And Father, we, we, we lay them out each Sunday, and we just, I, I pray that we get on our hands and knees, and, and I mean, Father, I'm old, and it's hard to get on my hands and knees anymore, but I try to get on my hands and knees as often as I can and offer these, these prayers up to you. We, we name them off one by one, and the Bible says that you will fulfill your will in each one of them. And Father, we have to also understand that what our will is for the, these things may not be your will for it. 
But we have to pray that your will be done. As Christ prayed before he went to the cross, he said, Father, he said, not his will be done, but your will be done. Father, I just thank you so much for giving us the opportunity as a church to come together and pray and come together and in fellowship, come together and, and hear the word of God and, and the bread of life in your presence. And Father, we'll give you the praise and glory for all that happens in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I tell you, on the pickpocket thing, uh, what impressed me, I talked about it a little bit in Sunday school, was how people here put aside what they were doing on a Saturday to help me get that handled. We actually had the, the cards blocked within an hour of me being pickpocketed, even though I was in Paris. And uh, uh, that's pretty amazing when God's people come together, put aside what they're doing to help somebody else. I was very blessed by that. Just a practical lesson for you in this. This is not preaching. We'll get to preaching in a minute, amen. But... Uh, I have traveled Central America, North America, Iceland, Africa, and a good little bit of Europe. And I was pickpocketed for the first time in my life yesterday. They got uh, two church cards, my card, uh, Nathan's birthday check, some cash euro, my cat card, my driver's license, my European driver's license. They got it all. It's just momentary lapse of judgment. Always, I took my money out of my, I took my wallet out of my front pocket to pay for the subway tickets, mm -hmm. but without thinking, I put it in my back pocket. And about three minutes later, I no longer had a wallet, amen? Uh, lesson hard learned. But if you do go to Paris, keep your money in your front pocket, <laughs> or like I generally do inside my shirt, amen? So, <clears throat> there are lots of uh, illegal immigrants there, and I guess they gotta make a living too, amen? So. Let's stand and turn to number 355. Jesus paid it all. Amen. You could pray two things, that getting my cat card back is not a big deal, and that these there were actually already charges on two of the accounts, uh, even though we had them blocked there within an hour, and they were pending. So you could pray that the banks have the uh, kindness to deny those charges and not cost us money. Amen. I can hear the Savior say, Thy strength in me is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me. and life uh, uh, truly rose again and that 
in that way you give us true life and peace to all it uh, takes that the situation in Ukraine and all around can be solved. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated.
eternity share with my Lord on the winning side. Well, I am on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. No more out in sin could I abide. I have enlisted in his fight for the cause of truth and right. Oh, bless the Lord, I know I am on the winning side. Amen. 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 I can't do it if, if, if it depended upon me to get myself saved or keep myself saved. I would spend eternity in a place of torment. Mm -hmm. I am thankful for my Savior. Amen. He did it all. We're in Matthew chapter 4 today. Matthew chapter 4, <clears throat> I'm going to read a verse, and uh, well, I'm going to read till I get to a period, which in most cases is one verse, and then I'm going to have Joe read it in German, and then I'm going to have uh, Damaris read it in Romanian, and we will read the whole chapter, but the good news is it's only about 25 verses, okay? Here we go. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Joe? Da war Jesus vom Geist und in die Wüste geführt, auf dass er vor dem, vor dem Teufel versucht wurde. Thank you, Ghana. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. Und äh, da er 40 äh, Tage und 40 Nächte gefastet hat, bugelte ihn. Uh, it was on mute, I got it now. <clears throat> and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Und der Versucher trat zu ihm und sprach, bist du Gottes Sohn, so sprich, dass dieses Zeile Wort werden. But he answered and said, it is written, notice that answer, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Joe? Und er antwortet und sprach, es ist, steht geschrieben, der Mensch lebt nicht von Brot allein, sondern von dem, diesem Wort, das durch den Mund Gottes geht. Then the devil takes them up into the holy city and setteth them on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Before they read, let me explain this to you. Satan then used God's own word to try to tempt God himself in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Joe? Hey. Und äh, da, da führt ihn der Teufel äh, mit sich in die heilige Stadt und stelle ihn auf, eine, auf die Zinne des Tempels und sprach zu ihm, bist du Gottes Sohn, so lass dich hinab, denn es steht geschrieben, er wird seinen Engel über dir befehlen, befehlen tun. Und sie werden dich auf den Händen tragen, auf dass du deinen Fuß nicht an ein Zeins tun. So what Jesus does is he responds again with the word. Just because somebody takes the word of God out of context doesn't change our response, right? Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Joe? So, da 
sprach Jesus zu ihm, wiederum steht auch geschrieben, du sollst Gott, deinen Herrn, nicht versuchen. And again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the earth, uh, excuse me, of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Joe? Wiederum führte ihn der Teufel mit sich auf einen sehr hohen Berg und zeigte ihm, alle Reiche der Welt und äh, ihre Herrlichkeit und sprach zu ihm, das alles will ich äh, dir geben, wenn du niederfällst und mich anbetest. Then saith Jesus unto him, get the hints, Satan, For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thy, thou serve. Let me break that down for you, all right? I'm going to put that in Mississippi for you. Ready? Get on out of here, Satan. I'm only supposed to worship the Lord, and that's what I'm going to do. Because that's what the Bible says. Joe? Da sprach Jesus zu ihm, Heb dich weg von mir, Satan, denn es steht geschrieben, Du sollst anbeten, Gott, dein Herrn, und ihm allein dienen. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Da verließ ihn der Teufel, siehe da, traten die Engel zu ihm und dienten ihm. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali. I'm not to a period, but I'm going to stop there. Joe. So, da nun Jesus hörte, dass Johannes überantwortet war, zog er in das galiläische Land, und verließ die Stadt Nazareth, äh, kam und, und wohnte in Kapernaum, die da liegt aber mehr den Grenzen von Sebulon und den Naphtalen. Naphtalen. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, or Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Job 15 and 16. Uh, 14 and 15. Auf das erfüllte würde, was geschrieben, was gesagt er ist von durch den Propheten Jesaja, der da spricht, dass das Land Zebulon und das Land Naphtalim am Wege des Meer jenseits des Jordans und das heidnische Galiläa, das Volk, das im Finstern saß, hat ein großes Licht gesehen und die da saßen am Ort des Gottes äh, Todes, dem ist ein großes Licht aufgegangen. Ein Licht aufgegangen. Okay, so we're going to skip a few verses. Uh, we're going to read verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Joe? Von der Zeit an fing Jesus an zu predigen und zu sagen, Tut Buße, denn das Himmelreich ist nahe beigekommen. Okay, so then he sees 
uh, Peter and, and Andrew uh, fishing in verse 19. He saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Job 19. Uh, und er sprach zu ihnen, Folge du mir nach, ich will euch zu Menschenfischer machen. And then he sees uh, John and James, and they follow him. Verse 23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Job? What verse? Verse 23 alone. And Jesus went around the whole Galilee, and in the ihren Schulen und predigte das Evangelium vom Reich und heilete alle Seuche und äh, Krankheit im Volk. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless the reading of your word. We're thankful for all that has come out this morning. From Miss Zita on the right to Miss Sherry on the left, Lord, to Shaley and Tyler, to Matt and Christopher and family, Lord, and just Otis and Eileen and so many that are here this morning. But I know in a group of 40 plus that are sitting here this morning, there are so many distractions in our minds of things that we need or maybe desire to do after church, of things that we have to do tomorrow and so many things take up our mind, Lord. And I pray right now that you would help every person uh, whether they're listening by way of Facebook because they have a child in the hospital or whether they're here in our midst to just put aside the distractions of life and listen to your word this morning. Lord, I pray that your word will have free course. Lord, I pray claiming the promise that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish what you set it forth to accomplish, Lord, and that is the redeeming of lost souls the refreshing of the leaving saints and the reviving of the lagging saints. Lord, just work in our midst this morning. We love you, and we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Listen, this is uh, mainly about Jesus and his followers, this entire text. If we read the other uh, two or three verses that we didn't read, we would find just that, okay? So those of you who maybe have a translation this morning, I'm going to follow that, but I'm not going to read it because I feel like it's a shackle and it, in it inhibits me from preaching, all right? So the first thing I want you to see in the first 11 verses, we see the manifested power of Jesus Christ. We see the manifested power of Jesus Christ in three ways. First, we see it in the facts, okay? He fasted. Now, many people today say that fasting is not for the church age. Hey, you know, I'm from Mississippi. You can talk to me when I'm preaching. So just real quick, there are multiple uses of the word fast. Somebody tell me what fast means in this context. Go on once and we'll call on somebody. All right, Joe. Uh, not eating. For... Exactly. Not eating for a period of time. And the Bible tells us here that Christ fasted for 40 days. Now there are three types of fast that we see in Scripture. There is what I call a supernatural fast. Moses, the Bible says exactly of Moses that he went 40 days and he didn't eat or drink. You try that and you'll die. Okay? Unless God tells you to do it because you can go 40 days without eating, but you go about three days without drinking and your body's going to start to shut down. You go 10 days without drinking, you're not going to make it, all right? It's just the way we're, our bodies are created. Our bodies are about $1.98 worth of dirt. We'll call it uh, inflation. It's $25 worth of dirt, and, and, and 10 gallons of water makes up the human body. You don't drink, you're going to die. There is what we call a Daniel fast. Daniel did not eat pleasant bread. He did not eat meat, and he did not drink from the fruit of the vine for three weeks. So he basically ate vegetables for three weeks. Okay? That's a good thing for us to do. And then there is a fast where we drink all that we need, but we do not eat. All right? That's what Christ did here in the context is he went 40 days without eating. Now, there are people who say, well, we don't fast in the church age because the church age is like harvest. Uh, and, you know, people don't fast during the time of harvest because they need the, the nourishment in order to work and harvest. 
But Miss Sherry, there's only one problem with that mindset. I've studied the scriptures, and the word fast is not associated with harvest anywhere in the Bible except in the book of Ruth, and it's a different use of the word fast. It is stay fast by. That means stay close by. Like you make something fast, you tie it down. It has nothing to do with eating. In fact, if you read, she ate well. So this idea that we don't fast in the church age, it's improper. It's not biblical. The, the other extreme is, well, the Pharisees twice, fasted twice every week, right? That's what they said uh, when the guy's praying, I fast twice in the week, right? That's what the Pharisees did. Most people believe they fasted on Tuesday and Thursday or what we would call Tuesday and Thursday. I don't know when they fasted. But it's not a competition to see if I can fast more often or more faithfully than you can. Okay? But it does take strength to be able to fast. And one more thing about us not fasting during the church age. In Matthew chapter 9 and Mark chapter 2 and Luke chapter 5, Jesus said, When the Pharisees questioned him, Otis, and said, How come your disciples don't fast? He said, they can't fast when the bridegroom's here, but when I leave, they'll fast. So fasting is appropriate. <clears throat> the scriptures clearly teach he arose to heaven, so he was taken from us. So we can fast. We talked about the three different types of fasting. Jesus' powers manifested in his fast. But how does this affect us? Last week we talked about we talked about hyper Nike. We talked about hyper Nike if we want to pronounce it as the Greeks would pronounce it. More than victorious. I can't tell you when you're supposed to fast. But I can tell you that the most victorious moments of the 25 years I've been in ministry were during or just after a fast to get the Lord's mind on something. It is a fast that will help you live. Now, if you don't know Christ, fasting is not for you. If you've not been born again, fasting's not for you. Fasting doesn't give you favor with God. Fasting takes your natural, your body's natural desire to desire something to eat, and you determinately de de decide that you're going to turn away from the natural desires of your body, and when your body hungers, you're going to turn to the Lord, and you're going to see, Phil said, uh, on our knees. There's nothing wrong with that. What are we doing when we bow our heads when we pray? What are we doing when we kneel down when, I, when we pray? Giving reverence. That's exactly right. The word worship means to, it, it, it's an old word, and it means not only to proclaim his word. A lot of us praise and worship Jesus. That's what we say, right? But true worship is here. Or here. Because I'm not worthy to stand in his presence. I'm not worthy to call his name. It is only by the blood of Jesus that I can call his name. It is only by the blood of Jesus that I can ask him to fulfill my request. And fasting is just one of the ways that God uses for a believer. Somebody who has been born again. Well, what does that mean, Brother John? Well, you have to understand God loves you. For God so loved Tyler. For God so loved <coughs> Lorelai. And we can get everybody else in the room. That he gave his only begotten son. But we're separated from that love by our own sin. I asked a group of teenagers a couple of years ago, Christian. What is it that every human is looking for? And honestly, I don't know that I've heard a wiser answer out of the mouth of somebody with a Ph.D., or a Ph.D., a doctor of philosophy or a doctor of theology. <laughs> Young man, raise his hand and says, we're all looking for somebody to say we're better than. But we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Now, Phil can find reasons why he's 
better than me. And I can find reasons why I'm better than Otis. Or Otis can find reasons why he's better than me. But you know what? When you stand before Christ, they're not going to say, how How did you add up against Miss Sherry? How did you add up against Miss Lon? When we stand before Christ, we have the perfect stature of Jesus Christ right there, and we all fall short. None of us add up to Christ. We have to grasp that fact to be saved. But you can understand that and still not be saved. You have to understand that sin has a salary. The wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God in a place of torment. You can understand that and still not be saved. You have to understand Christ died for us. The most amazing four words in Scripture. Christ died for Otis. Christ died for Joe. Christ died for Miss Krista. But we can understand that and still not be saved. If we really get a hold to our sin and his righteousness, we're going to say, Lord, save me. That, my friends, is salvation. It's not the words of a prayer. It's not, I once was lost, but now I'm found. It is the attitude of the heart and calling out to Christ, I need you. Well, I've told the story several times, Jeremy, but I've heard a, a grown man say, Lord, I, I've, been, I've been trying to call you my co-pilot for years. I just need to get out of the way and let you take, would you just take my life and you fly it from here on out? I heard, a, I heard a kid start with creation and go to the rapture and say, if you come back today, I couldn't go with you, Lord. I need you to save me. Would you save me so I can go with you? It's not the words of the prayer. It's the attitude of the heart. And each of us is created differently. So when you ask Christ to save you, it's going to be different than when I ask Christ to save me. I asked the other week, if anybody want to give a testimony, oh, they said, yeah, I got saved right about there. You remember it. People say, I was always a Christian. No, you weren't always a Christian. You were born a sinner. And there has to come a time when you call on Christ. But for those of us who have called on Christ, if we want to live that hyper Nike life, we probably go fast sometimes. You just need to understand that that fasting, that fasting is probably when Satan is going to affect you and fight you the hardest. Which brings us to the, to the next point. Christ's power was not only manifested in the fast, but it was just after the fast that Satan attacked him. So his power was manifest in the fight. If you're serving Christ, there's going to be a fight. You, you fight sin. You fight yourself. You fight society. And you fight Satan. And, and, and Satan is the wisest of your enemies because he can even twist God's word. And, 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 and that's how he got Adam and Eve way back in the beginning, right? We say Satan lied, but in reality, he took the truth of God's word and twisted it. What he said was not untrue. What he made them believe was untrue. So we say he spoke with guile in his mouth. But Christ... Christ was tempted in the same way that you're tempted, in the same way that Eve was tempted. In 1 John chapter 2, the Bible says that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's all sin. It has nothing to do with God. Christ was tempted in those three ways. Listen, the lust of the flesh. Hey, I'll give you bread. You turn these stones to, you turn these stones to bread. Jesus answered, it's written. That's how you answer the, the, when Satan attacks you, when yourself attacks you, when sin attacks you, when society tries to bring you down. You answer that with the word of God. Jesus was God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. He could have just said, get on out of here, and Satan would have had to listen. But he said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. He was then tempted with the pride of life. Hey, it's written. Satan uses the Bible against him. It's written that they'll bear you up where you won't even you won't even bruise your foot on a stone. We'll just jump off of this high place right here. He said, It's written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He was tempted with the lust of the eye. Hey. Or the pride of life. 
Thou shalt, if you, if I'll give you all this stuff if you'll just worship me. And the Lord answered, It's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God only. If the Lord answered Satan with Scripture, don't you think we need to answer Satan with Scripture? The problem is, it's preaching time. Many of us are biblically illiterate and we don't know how to answer Satan with Scripture. That's why we're teaching through the Bible in adult Sunday school class. That's why we're about to start through the doctrines of the Scripture in the young adults class. Because the Scripture says, study to show thyself approved. I'm not approved unto God because I fast more than you do. You can look at me and say, that's not true. Amen. I, I'm not approved unto God because, hey, uh, I'm stupid. I got pickpocketed yesterday for being an ignorant somebody. I'm not approved unto God because I wear a suit and tie when I preach. The servant that is approved unto God is the one who can rightly divide the word of God. And if you don't study it, you won't be able to rightly divide it. And then when Satan tempts you and Satan attacks you, you won't be able to manifest God's power in the fight because you don't have your sword sharp. Not only did he manifest his power, this manly preaching. <clears throat> Too much preaching today is, is man-centered. It's, it's health and wealth. Uh, God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Did you know everybody in this book died at least? Except for, uh, except for Elijah and Enoch. Everybody else in that book died questionable about Moses, but most people believe Moses died. God just let him see it first. The gospel is inclusive, but don't wrestle it to include what society wants it to include. Society, society wants to silence us, but a man of truth, be a man of truth. Be a lady of truth. Just tell the truth. What is the, help me Lord, what is the the, what's the word everybody uses today when they want to give a warning? I heard it in a I heard it in an employee meeting this last week. I'm gonna give you a caveat with that. What is a caveat? A caveat is kind of a warning, an exception. We're supposed to speak the truth, but how are we supposed to speak? In love. In love. If you tell somebody that they're lost and headed to hell, you need to have a tear in your eye. Because it's not good news. But in order for them to grasp the good news, they've got to grasp the bad news. Right. Listen, in his manly preaching, we read how he returned to Galilee so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. And Jesus uh, uh, did what the what he and the Father and the Spirit decided in in before he said let there be an eternity past before he said let there be light I think but the question is how does this affect us where does the Spirit want you to go who is it that the Spirit wants you to witness to I keep trying to get people to understand Cecile there are people that will listen to a little sweet Filipina lady that wouldn't listen to me. There were people that would listen to a, a German man who was converted in his 20s and turned from, from dead works to serve the living God. They wouldn't listen to that old fat American that came over here. Who does God want you to witness to? Where does the Spirit want you to go? Hmm. What did he preach? He preached repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is not. Some people will tell you that, that, that they dropped the re off of it, right? And we're going to do penance or penance. And we're going to do some Hail Marys or, or we're going to give some money to the church or we're going to burn some candles or we're going to walk up these stairs on our knees or, or we're going to fast for so many days or, or we're going to, to sit in sackcloth and ashes. You've got to ask yourself Am I making myself look good? Because 99% of religion is all about me. 
and how smart I am, how wise I am, and what good works I've done. But the relationship, it's all about him. Repentance is, I used to be able to do this when I was younger. I don't know that I can do it anymore. I watched you try to do it the other day. Hard to do it on carpet. But repentance is an about face. Repentance is, I cease to trust what I can do, and I start to trust what he can do. Repentance is, I'm done with me, and I'm forsaking all, and I'm trusting him. That's what Christ preached. When we go to witness, don't let people sidetrack you, Matt, because they're going to want to talk about other things that have nothing to do with them going to heaven or going to hell. We've got this. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Right? Yes. Jesus returned to fulfill. He preached repentance to follow him. He had a magnetic pull. There's two kinds of pulls here. Hey, he had close followers and he had cultural followers. And there is a difference. And I think the average American, now I don't know too much about, I know one person well from Hungary, and she's sitting on the back pew. I know one other person, sort of, that we got a testimony from last week, which is the missionary to Hungary from Hungary. That's it. That's my only knowledge with Hungary. I don't know much about Hungary. I know a little bit about South Carolina. I spent 90-something days of my life there. I went at 218 and I left at 163. I went as a recruit and I came out a Marine. We have cultural Christianity in the, at least in the southern part of the U.S. If you're born in the Bible Belt, then you know all of the Bible words, right? We know grace. We know repentance. We know salvation. But then we have this mindset that me and Jesus got our own thing going. But that's not Bible. Jesus is no respecter of persons. Salvation, true salvation, is calling on him, trusting in him. If I trust in him, I'm going to follow him. If I follow him, I'm going to be fishing for me. Now here's where the rubber meets the road. You ready? If you're not fishing, you're not following. Period. I don't care how often you go to church. I don't care how much money you put in this plate. I don't care how much money you put in the plate at somebody else's church. I don't care how many Hail Marys you do, how many rosaries you do. I don't care how many days in the week you fast. If you're not following, if you're not fishing for men, you're not following the master. That is the major divider between cultural Christians and and people that have truly been born again. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. What did both sets of men do? Immediately, they dropped their nets and went with him. Cultural followers. The, the, the last statistic I read until I prepared this sermon was that 85% of the United States still claims to be Christian. Sadly, that number has dropped. 63% of the U.S. identifies as Christian. But look at the news. Tell me the news says we're Christian. Hmm? I've said it before, but coming to church, I said it in Sunday school, coming to church does not make you a Christian any more than sleeping in the carport makes you a Cadillac or a Chrysler or whatever else you want to say. Hmm. You say, oh, Jesus didn't have any cultural followers, all those people. I mean, I'm going to read you one verse of scripture and then I'm going to come in for a landing. The other day, this is a rabbit trail. I'll get to the verse in a second. We'll give all my time to get out. The other day, I was standing at SAC, Simbach School Aid Center, talking on the phone. And anybody know the building number for SAC? Ms. Sherry, do you know the building number? 66. 66. So one of my coworkers took my picture standing under that number and said, don't be the third city. Amen. <laughs> now, why did I hit that rabbit trail? Because in John 6, 66, the scripture says, 
from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were just cultural followers. They weren't truly saved. So here's my question for you this morning. Do you really know Christ? Remember that Sunday school song I talk about all the time? If you're saved, then you know it, then your life should surely show it. Don't answer out loud. Okay? Don't answer out loud. Don't raise your hand. But who read their Bible since last Sunday? I just said, don't raise your hand, Joe. Joe, raise your hand. I'm glad you read your Bible. I don't want you to respond, seriously, because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I want us to think. That's the whole purpose of a sermon, right, is to make us think about ourselves and our relationship with the Lord. Who manifested joy this week? Who lived out the song? The song? This is my sister's life verse, I think. I'm going to read you a song real quick. Just one verse of one song. How about that? <laughs> Psalm 40, and verse number 3, the scripture says, He has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Just manifesting the joy of Jesus will lead people to Christ. Hmm. We're talking about our Christian life. Don't raise your hand. But who listened to or read the devotions that the church puts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, LinkedIn. I mean, we're giving you tools by which you can study the Word of God. Who invited somebody to the church this week? The Bible says, He has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Hmm. Which one of us tearfully told a friend repent and believe the gospel because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hmm? Where are you spiritually this morning? I'm going to ask Michelle to come and play anything. And I'm going to ask you to stand and close your eyes. If you're lost this morning, if you don't know that you have a home in heaven, then repent and believe the gospel. Maybe you're here this morning and you know you're saved. You've read 1 John 5, 13. You know that you're born again, but you know you're not where you need to be. What's the point? What do I do? Repent and believe the gospel again. You don't have to get saved again. You just have to get back in that place of protection from the Lord. Maybe you're a leading saint this morning. I could name some names that the pastor doesn't know what he can do without. Some of them write checks. Some of them teach Sunday school classes. Some of them do sound and video. Maybe you're tired in the way. What do you have to do? Repent and believe the gospel. It'll re-energize you. You know, it all comes down to that right there. Many of us say that we're saved, but we don't have that joy. We're not witnessing like we should. Then we have to get back. I don't have to get saved again, thankfully. If it depended upon me, I'd be burned in hell right now. It's all about Christ. I'm in His hand, and no man can pluck me out. But believe it or not, we can be joyless, unfulfilled, and nearly useless in His hand. Still saved, but not doing what we know we need to do. And the answer is turn to Him again. There's just something about that name, baby.
trust all hearts and minds are clear. And we simply 